Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to have you here. Uh, it's going to be a great time of worship. Uh, for those of you watching at home, uh, you're not going to notice anything different. Uh, but if you um, uh, were here in the building today, you would see that we actually have human beings on stage playing instruments and singing instead of having the video. So um, if you're staying home because you're you're wanting to be cautious and careful for health, that's great. Uh, don't worry about it. But if if you've kind of been holding off going, I want to wait till the singing is live again. Uh, well, guess what? Now is your time. So uh, we would love to see you back in the building soon. Uh, we want you to come back, though, more than anything in your timing. When you feel uh, ready, when you feel safe, when you feel comfortable, uh, we are excited and ready to welcome you back. But we're going to do the best online worship that we can until that point. Now, I'm excited about today. I'm excited to just worship and lift up God's name. I'm excited to continue talking about Easter and this last week of Jesus' life leading up to, to Easter, uh, to his death, to that, that period in between, and then Easter, of course, his, his resurrection, this time of celebration. Let's start this morning with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for uh, who you are. I thank you for what you have done for us. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that that we have this glimpse into his last week, these, these chapters that, that we can just study to see uh, how Jesus spoke and how he behaved. And Lord, just learn from that and grow from that. God, I pray that you would uh, be at work this morning. Open our hearts, open our minds to you. In your name I pray, amen.
Well, today we're going to be continuing our series, uh, looking at the last week of Jesus' life here on earth. Uh, this, this week where he did so many uh, influential, important things. This, this week that when you read through uh, the New Testament, when you read through the Gospels, you see how much time the author spent focusing on this week on this time that, that Jesus was here on earth. And, and today I want to look, we're going to be in, on Tuesday, and really look at, at what Jesus did on Tuesday. And in fact, we may, depending on which author you look at, some of the things we were looking at may be Wednesday stuff, but, but it may have been Tuesday too. But today is, is an interesting one. We're going to move uh, pretty quick today through a lot of different uh, confrontations, discussions, uh, times of Jesus teaching. And we're going to look at several, uh, we're going to move through them. And, and here's what I want you to pull out today. Uh, have you ever had a time, have you ever had a time in your life when you just had questions and you didn't know what to do or how to respond or, or what to say or, or where to go? In fact, I, I would imagine most of us have, I've had so many times like that in life. I've had so many times where, where I just wanted God to give me direction and I felt confused and, and out of touch. And even so many times when I was trying to figure things out, I can remember as a young man, some major life decisions. I can remember trying to figure out where to go to college. I can, try to, I can remember trying to figure out what should I do as a career? What, what, what should I do in my life? And trying to figure out what, what direction to go. I can remember after college trying to figure out who, who should I marry? Is, is there someone out there for me? God, where should I look to find someone to spend life with? And decisions about where to move and, and where to live and, and what house to buy. And, and so many different major life decisions I can remember just struggling with and wrestling with. I can remember smaller decisions even. Decisions at, at work or in relationships and, and decisions where should I, should I continue this relationship? Should, should I have a conversation? How do I handle this situation that's come up? What, what, what do I need to do here? How do I figure this out? What, 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 what is the appropriate way to handle this? How, how can I fix something that's been broken? Or how can I uh, move something forward that's been stalled? Or, or how can I go back to something that maybe went a wrong direction? How can I keep things trucking in a positive way that has been going in a positive way? And there's so many times in life when we, when we have questions. And we try to figure out what, what should I do? Where do I go from here? And today I want to look at, at some times where Jesus actually sits down and, and he's really sharing wisdom. And, and as he's going through, there's going to be several times where the, the, the teachers of the law, these Jewish religious leaders, the people that, that all of the nation, all of the Jewish nation looked at as the wise, godly folks that they need to learn from and grow from. And how here's Jesus talking to them or about them and and he completely, because of his wisdom and his knowledge and understanding, completely mentally towers above them. And it's this reminder that when we have questions in life, <laughs> when we have questions in life, Jesus has the answer. And so I want to look today... Uh, I want to start walking through this. And we're going to be back in Mark, and we're going to be back uh, starting today in Mark 11. And I want to look at just these different uh, times of, of teaching, of confrontation, and see how Jesus handles them. Mark 11, starting in verse 27. And it says, They arrived again in Jerusalem. This is Jesus and his followers. They arrived again in Jerusalem. And while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you authority to do this? 
And so here's Jesus, he's teaching, and these, these leaders, these teachers of the law, they come up and they want to confront Jesus. And it makes perfect sense, because two days ago we had the triumphal entry, where he entered Jerusalem, everybody's cheering him on, they're expecting this warrior king, and the, the leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, everybody's going, oh no. What's going on here? Is he going to rile up the Romans? Are people turning to him instead of following us? We, what's going on? And then the next day, Monday, last week, what we talked about, Jesus comes into the temple and starts overturning the tables and driving out the money changers and the animal sellers and, and dealing with people in the temple. And so Jesus now comes in and he starts teaching people and these leaders these teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they want to know what's going on here. We got, we got, to, we got to try to nip this in the bud. We got to make sure that, that we are okay, that, that people will still look to us. And so they come to Jesus and their first question is, who gave you the right? Who gave you the right to act like this? To come in on this donkey with everybody celebrating? To come in and, and go into the temple and drive our people out? Who gives you the authority to do that? And Jesus, in his, his brilliance, has such a wise response. Because, because if he simply responded God's authority, then they would have this debate. Oh, well, well, where did you get, you know, how do you know you have God's authority? How can you prove it? And if, if he said, my own authority, they're going to say, well, whose authority is that? And, and so instead of him giving just a response, he always responds. I always hate when, when, when I was a kid, I had hate when my parents would respond to a question with a question. And yet it's such a brilliant response. And that's how Jesus responds here. And he says, and he says well, by whose authority was John preaching? Tell me whose authority John was preaching by. And, the, and, and here they're stuck because they've got two responses. They can say John came from God's authority, but, but if John has God's authority, then, then they look awful because they didn't follow John. And so they go, well, that's not a good way to go because if we say this guy has God's power and we didn't follow him, then, then that's, <laughs> that makes us look really bad. But if... If we say John has only man's authority, only his own authority, then, then these people around, then they were scared of the people. They were scared of the crowd and the power that the crowd had to rise up. And so they, they said, if we say John didn't come from God, this, this crowd could turn against us, which is what they wanted more than anything. Was they wanted the crowd to follow them. And so, and so here they are, stuck. Jesus had asked them a question now, and now they're stuck. And so they have to, these, these brilliant minds, these leaders, these Jewish leaders, these men who, who everybody looked to for answers and guidance and wisdom had to respond with such weakness. The only response they could give was, we, we don't know. We don't know. And so Jesus says, well, if you don't know that, I'm not going to tell you whose authority I am falling under. And he, he makes them humiliated. He humiliates them because they have no response for his brilliance. They're trying to make him look foolish, trying to be able to challenge him. And instead, he makes them look foolish. So then he moves on, and Jesus moves now to a parable. And this parable is a parable about a, a vineyard owner and, and in this parable, he's attacking these Jewish leaders, the teachers of the law, the, this, the Pharisees. He's attacking them very outright. And he says there's this, this vineyard owner who represents God, by the way. And, and this vineyard owner uh, sets up his vineyard real nice. He gets everything set up. It's great. And he rents it out to some people to work in the vineyard. That's a pretty common thing back then. And so this, the, the, the people come in, they start working the vineyard, started growing fruit. Well, the vineyard owner moves away. And after a time back then, it was usually every few years that the payment of rent for the property was due. And so after a few years, the, the vineyard owner sent a servant back. And they start beating up the servants. He sends a servant, they beat him up and send him back. They beat him up and send him back. And it gets to the point 
where their hearts turn even from, from beating up to killing. And, and it says the vineyard owner, in this parable that Jesus is telling, the vineyard owner sends his own son and says, they'll respect my son. And they see him coming and these, these workers, they grab the son and kill him. And their thought process, if we kill the heir, we become the heirs. This property now belongs to us. And it's a very thinly veiled story. I don't even know if it's really veiled at all. An attack on these Sadducee or Pharisees and, and teachers of the law, these, these Jewish leaders that, that had, when God had sent prophets in the Old Testament, their ancestors had attacked and mistreated and abused over and over and over again. And now that Jesus, God's son, is coming, they're going to kill him. He's even prophesying, foreshadowing his, his death to come. And they're sitting there stewing about it, right? Frustrated. Because what can you say to an attack like this? Because if he really is God's son, they look really, really bad. And so he, he, he makes them look terrible, these people who every time that the vineyard owner is sending somebody, he says, now the vineyard owner is going to come and punish those renters. And it's easy when the vineyard owner is far away. What he's saying is when the vineyard owner is far away, when you think God's up in heaven, he's not doing anything on earth, it's easy to start thinking, well, maybe we have the power here. Oh yeah, the vineyard owner sent some people. He's, God sent prophets. He sent his son here. But you know what? We're still not convinced that God's actually going to do anything. We want the power. We want to be the heirs to all this. We want to be the ones in control. And so Jesus is, is attacking them very much. And, and if we look down in Mark 12... Uh, to verse and look at verse 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11, it says, haven't you read this passage of Scripture? And this is where he's really, really bringing it out into the light. He says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And so he's quoting Scripture to show them, I'm that stone. You've rejected me. You've attacked me. You've treated me like a son. In fact, you're going to kill me in a few days. And yet God is using me as the cornerstone, as the key foundation piece to everything that he's doing. And if you look down in verse 12, we see the response then. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him. Because they knew he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. And you see, we see again that, that Jesus here is, is, uh, is making them look. He's trying to show the people, these guys think they're so important. Everyone looks up to them, but they have rejected God. And they've rejected everyone that God has sent. And the response of these chief priests and teachers and elders is instead of having soft hearts and realizing, oh man, we have messed up. Because that's what happens when you have a heart for the Lord is when you realize you've messed up, you immediately repent and go back to God. But instead, their hearts are hard. And so all they were doing was trying to find a way to kill Jesus. And so, then Jesus moves on. He's, he's been confronted by them. He's also then been um, outspoken and had this parable. Now they're, they're going, we've got to find a way to arrest this guy. We've got to get rid of him. Well, now they decide to challenge him again. They go, let's try to make him look foolish again because Jesus has the answer, right? When they come and confront him, about in the first situation, this, this story about whose authority he came at, Jesus has an answer. When he tells this parable and is talking about how, how these, these guys are trying to take control, but ultimately, I have the answer. Whether they're willing to listen or not, Jesus has the answer. Well, then they come to him and they ask about this tax situation. Here's what they say. It says, verse 13 of chapter 12, it says, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Never a good idea. Uh, doesn't pan out well. They came to him and said, Teacher, 
We know you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? And so, so they come to him now and they say, We're, now what about, what about taxes? We have this imperial tax to Caesar. And there were several taxes. This area was directly under Caesar's rule. Some areas had, um, had specific leaders that they were under the authority of. But this area, because of conflict uh, years before, had come directly under Caesar's reign. And so they paid direct taxes to Caesar. And there were several taxes. There was like an income tax and a property tax. But there was this, this tax, which was basically a tax for existing. <laughs> a tax that you had to pay just for the permission of, of being alive and being ruled over by the Romans. And it was a very hotly debated tax by the Jews. Because there had been some uprisers back at the very beginning when this tax was first levied who had, who had tried to rally people against and, and fight against this tax. And even now, the, the people who were, who were very zealous, some of, even some of the zealots, were, were still kind of having that as their rallying cry. Maybe we shouldn't be paying this tax. Let's, let's fight against this. Let's rebel against this. And so they're, they're trying to debate this text. There was a huge, hotly debated uh, thing between the Jews in that time. And so Jesus gets asked this hot topic. What, what's, what should we do here with this tax? How, how should we handle this, this tax? And it was a tricky question because if he said, oh yeah, pay the tax to Rome... Yeah, pay the tax to Caesar, that's fine. It would have been considered an act of treason because, because he's telling his own people to pay a tax to an authority that wasn't from among God's people, wasn't among the Jews. But if he said, oh no, you shouldn't pay this tax, then they had the, the ability to go to the Romans and say, hey, this guy is preaching against you. He's, he's talking about uprising. And they could turn him over to the Romans to take care of. But Jesus, once again, so brilliant. He says, bring me a coin. And they bring him the coin. And he says, Who's, whose face and inscription are on this coin? And they say, well, that's, it's Caesar's, of course. That's what you did when you came into power back in those days. The first thing you did was you make your own money, make sure your face is on it, what you want to say is on it. And so Jesus says, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And you see, his point here was, look, we can debate about taxes all day, but guess what? That's just money. God doesn't care about money. He cares about people. God cares about individuals. He wants each one of you to be giving yourselves to God. The money stuff, that, that's, that's beside the point. Go ahead and pay that tax. Who even cares about that? God's got bigger fish to fry, so to speak. And so again, he outwits them. He outsmarts them because Jesus has the answer. <laughs> so then he goes on and they come at him again and they ask another question. A very common situation. They're asking these common situations that they debated all the time. And they said, this time it was a different group. This time it was actually the Sadducees. And the Sadducees came to Jesus and they said, we have a question for you. They said, we want to ask about marriage in the afterlife. They said, suppose there's a guy who died and his wife was left. She didn't have a child, so he had no heir. And so this widow marries the man's brother. And this was a very this was their law back then. I don't know how much it was actually literally put into practice, but this was supposed to be what they did. Uh, and so it would have been a well-known situation uh, that the Jews could have faced. And they said his brother dies. And so she marries the next brother, because that brother didn't leave an heir. And so he goes down, seven brothers all married this woman, and they all died without having a child with her which is a somewhat of an extreme, but, but again, the people would have understood this situation as they're standing around listening. And he said, they said, so now this woman dies after marrying all seven brothers, having no heirs. She goes to heaven. Who's, whose husband or whose wife will she be? Which one of these seven men when, when she
when she's in heaven? Who, who will she be married to? And the Sadducees were asking this question. It was a very sneaky question because the Sadducees were this group. They were a very powerful group, but they were a small group, and they were a group that actually didn't even believe in the afterlife. So not only were they trying to trick Jesus by asking him a question about this woman and who will she marry and, and go, the afterlife is confusing, but they're actually also, in an underhanded way, trying to go, we don't even believe in the afterlife. Look how foolish this idea of an afterlife actually is, of resurrection of the dead. That doesn't even make sense. Now, the Sadducees were this group that didn't believe in an afterlife. They also only followed the, the, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. And so they studied these books very well. They were very knowledgeable about these books. And yet Jesus is so brilliant that he out-debates them <laughs> using their own scripture. In fact, the first thing he says is, you obviously don't know the scripture because it talks about, and he's quoting from the Torah, from their books that they study. He said, first off, in heaven... There's no marrying or being given in marriage. We, he doesn't say we are angels. He doesn't say we're like the angels in everything. But he says we're like the angels in that. In that ma angels don't get married. In heaven, we're not going to worry about marriage. So it doesn't matter. So you're in error there. But then, even more to your point, I, I want to talk about the fact that you don't believe heaven exists. And this was something the Pharisees and Sadducees debated all the time. It was tricky. It was very tricky for the Pharisees because they had to do, debate out of the Torah. And so Jesus does that. He pulls from the Torah and listen to what he says. Verse 12, or chapter 12, starting in verse 26, he says, Now about the dead rising, getting to your real issue here. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. And so Jesus uses their own text that they follow, that they study, that they know so well to say, look, God calls himself the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. When he's talking to Moses, he doesn't say, I was their God. He says, I am their God. And this is after they had been dead off of this planet for years. And so if God calls himself their God, their current God, not their previous God, then that means that they're still alive. Because God is the God of people who are alive. He's not the God of dead people. He's not the God of, of bodies. That doesn't even make sense. And so if God calls himself the current God of our forefathers, then there obviously has to be some sort of life after this planet. And he again makes these, these leaders look foolish with his wisdom and understanding because Jesus has the answers. Then another Jewish leader comes over. And this time, the way the text writes it, it looks like he's actually asking because he wants to hear Jesus' response. It's a learning thing. It's a, it's a trying to understand and see where Jesus is at rather than trying to trick him. And this is the famous uh, time where he asks, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he throws in the second, also, love your neighbor as yourself. And the man sees Jesus' wisdom here because all of the other laws, everything else, every other commandment, everything else that God desires of us really falls under that Umbrella. If you love God, you're going to do anything to serve Him and be obedient to Him and to show your love and gratitude for Him. And if you love God's people, which also falls under loving God, but if you love God's people, you're going to serve them and put them first and show them love as a way of, of loving God's special creation and God Himself. And so Jesus again, in fact, the guy even admits, the man who asked the question even admits, you have answered wisely because Jesus has the answer. Then Jesus makes a switch here. He's been going back and forth with the leaders and he kind of makes a little change here. And he has a teaching moment with the people. And starting here in uh, verse 35, it says, When Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he said, he asked, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah 
is the son of David. And so now that he's going, how, is this, how does this work? He's, they call him the son of David, and that's actually one of the most common terms used for the Messiah, was son of David. And he goes, but, but David is calling him Lord, even though he's his ancestor. And how does this even work? And he doesn't really go into it very much here, but he's setting the stage so that people in a few days when Jesus has died, and then he's risen a couple days after that, people will start putting the pieces together. And will start understanding that he's talking about himself here as the Messiah. And he's preparing them in the future now, because, because he's Jesus and he has the answer. He understands what's going on. And then Jesus, finally, at the end of all of this, he has to get one more shot <laughs> in with the religious leaders. In verse 38, it says, As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy, lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. And he's saying, don't, don't follow these guys. Look at, look at these people. Look at who they truly are. Yeah, they look great. In fact, to go back to last week, they look like a leafy tree, a, a fig tree covered in leaves, but but there's no fruit. They're not worth following. Everything they're doing is, is for show. It's to look good. It's to get attention for themselves. It's to, to have power and influence over you. That's, that's not the type of person you should be following. Instead, the type of person that we should be following is Jesus, God's Son. Because Jesus has the answer. Jesus always has the answer. He has wisdom beyond our understanding. He has knowledge. He has, he has plans for us in life. He's, he's called each one of us into a, a wonderful relationship with him. And he desires the best for us. He, he's got a plan. He's got answers. Any question that you may have in this life, he has an answer for. Sometimes we don't get those answers in our own timing. Sometimes we have to be patient and wait for his timing. Sometimes the answer we get isn't an answer that we want, but he has an answer. Because Jesus has the answers, because he's got the wisdom. I want to leave you with three questions today. First off is, do you have a question or a problem in your life that you're wrestling with right now? Something that, that you're going, I don't know what to do here. I, I don't know what, I, what direction or where I should go or how to handle this. Do you have a question or something that you've been wrestling with lately? And, and if so, where have you been searching for answers? Have you been trying to be Patient and listen for God. Have you been seeking His wisdom and guidance in this? Or, or have you been looking elsewhere? Have you been looking internally, trying to figure things out on your own? Have you asked people for their wisdom? Have you, you looked to the world to try to understand what, what uh, culture says or, or what seems right? Or, or have you been searching for God's answers? And then lastly is what, what can you do to be patient and to look for God's guidance with these questions and issues that we face. If that's something you've been trying to do, what, what can you do to continue to actively be patient and wait for God's answers? And if you haven't, if you've been looking other areas, what can you do to kind of refocus yourself on God and go, no, you you are what I need to wait on. Jesus, you are the one that I need to get direction from because you have the answer. Let's pray. Lord, I, I, I ask that you help us. Help us not to try to run ahead from you or around you or away from you when we're trying to figure things out in this life, but help us to run to you and to look for your leading and guidance. Even when it's hard, even when it takes more time than we want, Lord, help us 
to be patient, to be obedient, and to know that you have the answer. In your name I pray, amen. While we turned away from him, he turned his heart toward us. While we chased after selfish desires, he chased after us. While we made excuses for our misguided choices, pursuing an elusive sense of fulfillment, he emptied himself to take the form of a servant. This unthinkable inequity our Creator clothed in flesh and weakness for the sake of those clothed in iniquity. While we were lost and alone, He became a path for us. While we embraced the comfort of falsehood, He embraced us and showed us truth. While we were eclipsed in shadow, our spirits broken and dying, He became life and light to all. Our Shepherd, our teacher, our savior and king. And when it seemed the world had given up, he gave up everything. At just the right time, when we were powerless, he displayed his power and purpose. While we stood accused, he accepted the accusation. He endured humiliation and the untold suffering of crucifixion. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we deserved it, far from it, but because there has never been a greater love than the love of Jesus. Today, if you feel hopeless, He gives hope unconditionally. If you've been rejected, He accepts you completely. If your burdens weigh heavy, lay your fears and failures at the foot of the cross, for His blood has erased them entirely. No longer a slave, but an heir of salvation. You are his child, his chosen. You are his beloved.
Good morning. Last week, my eight-year-old Elsie fell at the park while she was riding her bike and scraped up her knee pretty good. Uh, we've, we've been keeping a close eye on it through the various stages of recovery, and we think she's going to be just fine. Uh, but it's funny because all of us as, ki as kids have, have uh, fallen and scraped our knees. It's just part of being a kid. You know, I'm pretty sure that Jesus fell and scraped his knees a few times. He probably wasn't riding his bike when he did it, but I'm sure it happened. I'm sure he got um, poked by sticker bushes when he was out playing with his friends. Um, I'm sure he hit his thumb with a hammer when he was learning uh, how to do carpentry. I mean, he worked construction. I'm sure he at some point dropped a two by four on his toes. They didn't have steel toed sandals back then. But Jesus bled like the rest of us. I know he did. He bled at the Garden of Gethsemane uh, when, uh, as he was praying for the coming trial before, his, uh, before the crucifixion. And uh, we know that his, his blood pressure was so high that, that the capillaries in his skin burst and, uh, and he was sweating drops of blood. We know he bled as he stood before the council, uh, the Jewish council, and they beat him. We know he bled when he stood before Pilate and they flogged him. We know he bled uh, the entire walk of the Via Della Rosa to the place of the crucifixion. And we know that he bled when he was on the cross until there was nothing left to bleed. Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh, bleeding from scraped knees, bleeding from flogged shoulders, bleeding from sticker bushes and from a crown of thorns, bleeding from a a misplaced hammer strike, bleeding from the executioner's nails. As we drink the juice, we are reminded of his death, of his blood. And as we look at the empty cup, we are reminded of his resurrection. Romans 6, 3 through 4 says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Living like us, bleeding like us, bleeding for us. Going before us into death so we need not fear it. Taking his place at God's throne so we could come near it. We take this bread, we take this juice, and remember who freed us as we work and we wait. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time this morning set aside by your son for us to remember his death on the cross, to remember his body, remember his blood that were broken for us, that covers our sins and allows us to come before you, to come before you as your children and to offer us new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, it's Ben. I just have a few announcements for you this week. So, Easter is real close. In the two weeks before Easter, we're going to be handing out supplies to get us prepared the week before. So, look for those. We're all, we'll all be doing the same thing uh, throughout the week of Easter. So, look forward to that. And on Easter, we're going to have an outdoor service with a lunch afterwards. 
and hopefully the weather will let us do that. Um, but look forward to that. It'll be a good time to fellowship, uh, social distance, of course, uh, but um, we'll be together and eating together and uh, celebrating that Jesus is risen. Also, on that evening, Easter evening, we're going to have our second communion service online through Zoom. Uh, the first week went really, really well. It was good to see everybody without masks on because we could see them on the, the screen of, on the computer. Uh, so it was really good uh, to see people and to fellowship through communion uh, that way. Also, we're going to have um, a Good Friday uh, service online and in person at 6.30 p.m. on Good Friday. So on March 27th, we're going to have a cleanup day outside just to get ready for that Easter service. So it's going to be outside, so it'll be easy to uh, be socially distant and to help kind of clean up our yard and uh, the grounds there at the church just to kind of spruce up for, for Easter. And then on uh, April 8th, we're going to have a blood drive. So sign up to give blood at the Red Cross website or talk to Larry if you want to help out with that event. So uh, the missions team, we're going to have, I'm going to have a few announcements here for the missions, from the missions team. Uh, we got a couple different ministries uh, that we support um, on a monthly basis already that need a little bit extra help. Uh, right now. First off, we got the Hams in Kenya. They got two separate uh, different ministries. Um, uh, they got lots of different ones, but we're going we're gonna to try to help with two different ones. Uh, we got, uh, so Missions of Hope International is part of what the Hams um, are a part of in Kenya. And they do little startup businesses, uh, for the nationals there and uh, one they want to do right now is um, is a wedding dress rental service uh, people wait for a long time uh, in Kenya to get married because they can't afford it uh, but this way um, this will be helping two different families um, in Kenya one is the family that has this little business of renting dresses that will provide an income and two, that second family will be the ones that are wanting to get married. That will provide them a cheap and different way to uh, obtain a dress. But what are they missing in Kenya that we have a plenty over here? And that's wedding dresses. So we want to ask you as um, supporters of the missions team here at Newport Christian, so we can support others, that you would donate wedding dress. If you have one up in the attic or in your closet that you haven't even looked at in years that you think maybe will provide, um, if you help somebody in need, please bring that to the church and we'll get it uh, sent off to Kenya. Uh, even if you don't have one in your closet and you want to like go to Goodwill or uh, a thrift store and buy one, that would be awesome too. Um, any shade of white would be uh, would be good. Any style uh, would also be fine. So if it's really old or if it's really new, uh, just go ahead and bring it and we'll, we'll, we'll see it off to Kenya uh, to help those, um, to help the hams help uh, people in Kenya. Uh, second for the hams, um, they are starting a, a summer camp this summer. Uh, and it is called the Ngaza Discovery Camp. And this will bring kids throughout Kenya to a camp where they can learn about Jesus. But they're missing something there, and that is fitted twin sheets. Now, you probably also have some of those laying around in your closet. And even if you don't, they're not very expensive at Walmart or something. Uh, they really only need the fitted sheet part. Um, but we'll also take those at the church and we'll get them s sent off to Kenya. Uh, those are just a couple ways to get involved in the ministry that the hams are doing in Kenya. Lastly, um, 
we want to help um, people in Myanmar right now. I don't know if you've heard what's going on, uh, but there's turmoil and uh, war and just a lot of stuff going on in Myanmar. We support the Morrises on a monthly basis and they are based in Chiang Mai, Thailand, but they do ministry in Myanmar. And we got some money going over there already, but we'd like to challenge you at Newport Christian to give a little bit more so we can send an extra thousand dollars. So you can skip a coffee next week, donate five bucks, 20 bucks, doesn't, doesn't matter how much, but let's get to that goal of a thousand dollars. We know that you're generous already, but we just ask that you'll be a little bit more generous and help us get to these three ministries, these three extra opportunities to help these ministries that, that uh, we support. So just a reminder, wedding dresses and fitted sheets for the hams in Kenya and any extra money that you can send that we can send on uh, to Myanmar. Uh, our goal is $1,000. Please help us reach that goal. We thank you. As part of the missions team, we thank you for your generosity and your support already. And uh, we thank you in advance for the help that you're going to provide to uh, Kenya and Myanmar. Thank you guys for everything that you do. And have a great week. Hey, thanks for joining in uh, today with us. As Ben just mentioned, I want to hit it again. Uh, Easter is coming. It's going to be great. We're going to have some special things. Um, in fact, one of the things is a Good Friday service, like Ben just said. It's going to be uh, at 6.30. We're going to have it online uh, for those of you who want to do it there. Or we're going to actually have an in-person service as well this year. And it's this time on Good Friday to just, just stop. And just focus on, on this immense sacrifice that Christ gave for us. And just to reflect and to even try to understand the love that was poured out. And the feelings of, of confusion and hurt that so many of Jesus' followers were feeling at this time. What a, what a powerful emotional time. And we want to really just... Spend a little time focusing on that. And so I, I hope you can join us either in person or online. Uh, if you need prayers, if you need encouragement, if you need uh, support this week and just some help, if you want somebody to talk to, if you want to learn what does it mean to begin a relationship with Christ? He, he died to be my Savior. What does that mean? I would love to talk to you about that. Uh, you can reach out and email office at newportchristian.com or you can call 541 265 2531, and I'd love to spend a little bit of time with you. God bless. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice and his love for us, Lord. Help us to just live for you out of gratitude. In your name I pray. Amen.